If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. I must tell you I'm quite excited. We have today with us Major General Roland de Vries. Now I recall with uh, Sapi Marais, I said that he doesn't need any introduction. And you know what? There was one uncle who was very angry with me. And I don't know why. But I'm willing to say it again. Roland de Vries does not need any introduction in the South African military. There are some people who say he's Heinz Kadirian of South Africa. There's some who says he's like Rommel. There's others who say he's like Peter. And all of them are true. General, we are very grateful for you. Thank you for being here with us. You're probably the most famous officer we have had on the show to date. Can I ask you, where do you come from? Chris, thank you so much for uh, that uh, introduction of yours. I do not necessarily agree with everything that you said, but uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, have this talk with you and uh, all our members who listen to your show. And I would also like to make use of this opportunity to say thank you so much for what you are doing for our veterans and also for, uh, uh, for the privilege to participate in in this session, which, uh, uh, which reflects the military history, the proud military history of our country. So thank you so much for that. And uh, uh, it's a pity that uh, we couldn't have a eye-to-eye -eye conversation with all the members participating in this dialogue. But anyway, I'm, I'm ready to, uh, to participate. And uh, um, I view you as my uh, interrogation officer. Now, to start off, um, I was born in Pretoria in 1944. Uh, I'm now at the age of 77. Um, I went to school in Fonabale Park. I never, I was never fond of Fonabale Park. I used to to uh, talk about the Black Hole of Calcutta. My my mother, uh, Ellen, didn't like that too much. But anyway, I matriculated there in 1962, and uh, my my whole uh, drive was to, to join the military. Um, I wanted to join the Rhodesian army, but uh, my father and mother put a stop to that. And they said that uh, they will allow me to, to join the South African army. So in 1963, I was off to the South African uh, army military gymnasium, the army gymnasium in Pretoria, where I started my milita military career. And at the end of that year, I enrolled uh, in an officer's course and qualified as a second lieutenant in uh, April 1964. And uh, I then started my milit military career as a young subaltern. And I was transferred to, to Bluefontein 1 SSB uh, as an infantry officer. They had an infantry company there. And I spent four years there. And during that period, that was sort of my formative years as a, as a young officer. Um, I also attended the uh, parachute jumping course, and uh, that, to my mind, was exhilarating. It's always uh, sort of um, invigorating to one if you pass one of those courses and, and you receive your wings. Uh, I was then off to the, uh, the Darnitron Combat School, uh, where we started with the training of commando officers and, uh, and, and their junior ranks. Um, I was involved in the training of section commanders and, pl and platoon commanders, which gave me a thorough basic with regards to uh, infantry uh, basic tactical training. Uh, I was then selected to go to the School of Infantry. Uh, I spent six years at the School of Infantry in, in Oudshoorn. During that period, I uh, became involved with the development of the Rattle Infantry Combat Vehicle, uh, which included the development of the doctrine for that sp specific combat system. And uh, at the end of my uh, term at the infantry school, I was transferred to one South African infantry battalion in Bloemfontein, which became the home uh, for mechanized infantry, uh, where we started establishing the mechanized infantry system. Uh, I was there for two years, uh, initially as a company commander, and later on, I became the second command of the, uh, of the unit. 
the first uh, course uh, with regards to mechanized infantry on the Rattle. Uh, infantry combat vehicle was uh, presented at the infantry school. Um, I did that with, uh, with uh, now Brigadier General Tony Savadis. That course was presented in October 1957. And the first uh, 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 course on, on the Rattle and for mechanized infantry uh, in the training of junior leaders was presented at one South African infantry battalion. Uh, the next year, in October 1976, I later on became the second in command at the uh, at at the mechanized infantry training establishment, uh, which we refer to as one Sai, one South African Infantry Battalion. And then in 19, I must just remember correctly, 1979, I was transferred to to Pretoria for the first time as a staff officer. Uh, my mission was to establish the mechanized infantry system and uh, develop the organizational uh, uh, establishments for uh, this type of organization within the uh, arsenal of the South African Army. Uh, fortunately for myself, I was, uh, I was appointed as the task force commander for task force X-ray, and uh, I found myself uh, at that at the latter part of that year, uh, spending uh, my time inside Rhodesia in, uh, with, uh, with uh, the uh, Rhodesian uh, army under the command of full brigade, uh, Mazvingu. Uh, at that stage, it was still Fort Victoria. Uh, our operational area was the Stengui Tribal Trust Land, and our operational base was uh, established at Mabalahuta next to the Nuanetsi River. So that gave me a stint with regards to counterinsurgency operations, operating with uh, the Rhodesian forces. Uh, we operated in Rhodesian uniform. And at that stage, uh, I carried the rank of uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, being seconded to the Rhodesian uh, uh, army. Uh, I can still remember traveling with the Dakota uh, at low level from uh, from Madimbo to my base at Mabalahuta, that there was a there's a, there was a, a sudden glint in the aircraft. The hole was punched through the bottom of the aircraft, the Dakota, and uh, through the top. And some terrorists uh, took a, a pot shot from below through the aircraft. So uh, I very quickly uh, searched for something which I can could could sit on because I wasn't. Uh, uh, completely happy with the idea of receiving a bullet through my backside. Anyway, that was uh, part of the, uh, the operational stint we had in Rhodesia. Um, in January, I flew back by L08 helicopter to Pretoria, and immediately uh, I, I went on the Command and Staff College immediately in 1980, and I completed that course, and at the end of 1980, I was transferred to 6-1 Mechanized Battalion as the officer commanding, uh, which uh, was a great privilege to command uh, a unit uh, which was equipped with Rattle infantry fighting vehicles and to utilize that combat system in operations inside the operational area in Southwest Africa, but then in inside uh, Angola as well. Uh, during uh, those two years, which I commanded the unit, 1981-82, I had the privilege to part participate in quite a few operations. Um, some of the internal operations in the area, which we refer to as the Triangle of Death, were Operations Carrot in 1981 and Operation Yahoo in 1982. Uh, during 1981, we also see one of the largest uh, conventional type actions taking place in Southern Angola, which was Operation Protea in August, September, 1981. Uh, later on, uh, which followed on that was Operation Makaro and Mirbos, uh, quick stints into Angola. And then at the end of the year, uh, in November, 1981, we participated in Operation Daisy, which was one of the longest uh, or the deepest actions inside uh, Angola at that stage with uh, with uh, combat forces, the likes of 3-2 Battalion, 201 Battalion, and then 6-1 Mechanized Battalion. During that particular operation, I can remember that 
we bundubashed uh, through the, the, the most dense area uh, with the thickest sand imaginable, imaginable for distances of up to 1,600 kilometers with a combat group which extended for, from, from the end to, to the front end of the column, uh, which was approximately 53 kilometers. So you can imagine uh, what the challenges were to uh, operate a force of that size inside Angola, um, independent for, uh, for periods uh, longer, than, longer than 14 days, and being self-sufficient with regards to fuel, helicopter fuel, water, um, rattle engines, rattle axle, axles, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this gave us the opportunity to, to in, in actual fact, develop the uh, mechanized infantry uh, concepts in, in, in much detail. Uh, it was a great privilege to command such a, such a prestige unit. unit. Um, we also participated in deep uh, operations inside Angola with regards to uh, high density counterinsurgency type operations such as Operation Mirbos in July, August, September 1982. At the end of my stint at 61 Mechanized Battalion, I was transferred to the Army Combat School at Luatla. I spent uh, five years at the school, uh, initially as the uh, training wing commander. We were responsible for the training of, of combat groups uh, battalion size uh, combat groups and, and brigade and even divisional size uh, fighting formations, which uh, gave me the necessary uh, background to understand in depth uh, what it was to conduct operations at the operational level of war, as well as the high tactical level uh, of operations. I had the privilege at the end of my stint at uh, the Army Battle School um, in early in October 1987, to be seconded to the uh, combat formation uh, inside uh, Angola, Southeast Angola. Uh, they were busy with Operation Modular at that stage. Um, and these were operations that uh, could be likened to uh, some of the uh, most high intensity conventional type battles for, fought in South Africa. South in, in South East Angola. Uh, of course, we operated with, with UNITA, which gave us the opportunity to develop mobile warfare concepts, uh, sort of fusing the concepts of mobile conventional warfare with those of uh, uh, guerrilla uh, type tactics. Um, this was also a thorough grounding for me to later on uh, write my book on, on mobile warfare for Africa, which is also a book currently being used by uh, military colleges overseas, such as the uh, Command and Staff College of the Australians in Canberra. Canberra. Um, at the end of modular, I was, uh, whilst I was in the bush, I was uh, appointed as the officer commanding of the South African Military College. And uh, when I arrived in Pretoria at the end of December, my wife and children were were already living in Pretoria. They, they moved on their own, uh, where I held my position, uh, my former position as the second in command at the, uh, at the uh, combat school. Uh, I was officer commanding at the, uh, at the Army College for three years. Uh, during that period, within the first three months, I was seconded once again as the second in command slash uh, Chief of Staff of 10 Division, which was hastily formed uh, in Sector, sector 10, uh, the operational area, which is the western part in Southwest Africa, the northern part of the operational area bordering uh, with, with Angola. That was when, uh, and this was quite a surprise for the South African Army, in actual fact, the South African National, uh, the South African Defense Force, when the 15th 50th Cuban Division was hastily deployed to the area of Kaama, and they posed a serious threat uh, for the integrity of uh, Southwest Africa. So I became the second in command of 10 Division 
Uh, at that stage, Brigadier Chris Safontaine was the commander of Sector 10. He was also appointed the commander of 10 Division, and we started preparing for a serious uh, onslaught uh, facing uh, the Cuban Division, as well as a number of Papla Divisions, as well as uh, Swapo Battalions. Fortunately, that war uh, did not develop uh, to its final stage, um, and on the 22nd of August, a peace treaty was signed uh, between the forces, the Angolan forces, the South African forces, and, uh, and the Cubans. And eventually that led to the signing of a formal peace agreement uh, in New York on the 22nd of December, uh, 1988. That ended that operation. Uh, I moved back to the South African Army College and I was uh, appointed thereafter as the Chief of Staff of Northern Transvaal Command. I uh, filled that post for two years. Um, this was a territorial command, which uh, gave me particular insight in terms of working with commando systems and territorial forces. And then at the end of my uh, term, term as the uh, the uh, Chief of Staff of Northern Transvaal Command. I was appointed as the Officer Commanding of 7 South African Division. I did that for three years. And after that, I was appointed as Director of Transformation. That was when the integration started and uh, the political uh, changes happened in South Africa. And uh, I was uh, appointed as, as one of the leaders to participate with the Chief of the the army, the chief of the defense force, and of course, the minister for defense uh, with regards to the whole transformation endeavor of the South African defense force and changing that into the South African national defense force. That was not the post that I sort of favored, but it's something that I needed to do because I was instructed to do so. Um, I learned a lot during that period, especially with regards to concepts of change management, uh, strategic transformation as such. And then during that period, I was appointed as, uh, as the chief of the Joint Training Division as a major general. And uh, my next posting was uh, as deputy chief of the army. And I filled that position until 1999, uh, where after I resigned, as a major general, although the Minister for Defence uh, requested me to stay, uh, in, actual fact, in actual fact, they said that uh, if I remained in the military, I would probably be appointed as the Chief of the Army or as the Chief of Joint Operations. But at that stage, because I decided that I wanted to do, so I wanted to do something else, and that gave me the opportunity uh, to, to do consulting work uh, within the strategic uh, security environment and the defense environment uh, in places like Africa and the Middle East. I also started uh, uh, or participated in, in uh, security uh, uh, challenges. Uh, for example, I helped uh, ESCOM develop a, 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 an extremely effective uh, concept uh, to defeat uh, conductor theft. It was an extremely successful operation. So I started uh, sort of spreading my wings and looking at, at other avenues uh, to sort of utilize the knowledge that I've acquired in the South African Army uh, for the betterment of the environment that, that I was operating in. Uh, in 2009, I spent a year in South Sudan. Uh, I supported the SPLA with their transformation program. They were converting from a guerrilla army to a more, a more professional oriented uh, defense force. Uh, Henriet, my wife, at that stage, she was working for the World Food Program as a counselor. Uh, she worked all over Africa. And in 2010, she was appointed uh, in, in that role uh, to Amman, Jordan, and later on to Dubai. Uh, where she, where she uh, did her work in, in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Timor-Leste, Tunisia, and, uh, and, and places in, 
in 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 Africa. Uh, I utilize that uh, that period uh, to do consulting services uh, to further my career with regards to that, and that also gave me the opportunity uh, to write my second book, which was entitled "Eye of the Firestorm," and soon after that. I wrote Mo Mobile Warfare for Africa. Uh, on that followed, uh, when I returned to South Africa in 2014, uh, uh, that followed on the writing of a book entitled Veiligheid for Gemeenschappen, Community Safety, which uh, is utilized uh, with, uh, with regards to community safety projects all over uh, South Africa. Um, I became involved in this venture uh, soon after I ret returned from, uh, from the Middle East, um, many of my friends uh, who served in the military, uh, who, also were, who were also farmers and businessmen, asked me to become involved in community safety. And for the last five years, I have been involved in helping communities uh, with their planning as, uh, uh, as a sort of a, a, a final... Uh, career uh, venture uh, from my part, and I'm still busy with that. Well, I must tell you, sir, we have one thing in common. I was born in Vienna. And every time I saw that place, I said to myself, I'm not even going to die here. I will take my grave and, and leave. Take my coffin and go away. <laughs> of course, you don't want to see Vienna today, especially the area of the station. Um, I I used to travel by bus, still a railway bus, from Van der Park to Vereniging Station to embark, to, uh, to go to either Lens, where I did cadet training, or Pretoria, where I did my military training, or from there I traveled to Bloemfontein with my bicycle on the train, uh, with my R1 rifle and my kit bag and uh, an old suit that I uh, sort of... Uh, received from my dad as a gift that was my first suit and uh, a Dunlop Max Ply squash racket so that station today looks like uh, an informal settlement yeah it's sad what happens there but you know as I always say to people the South African army defense force police everybody ran it over a country which was working and that's the one thing they cannot hold against us. It was working. It was there. What happened afterwards, we should not be blamed. Well, I always maintain that, uh, and that's, uh, that is internationally recognized, that we had one of the best small armies in the world. And uh, during the times that I lectured, I lectured for four, year, four years. Uh, COVID stopped that in actual fact in 2019, uh, I lectured for four years at the Defence College of the Australians at Cam Canberra. And uh, it was interesting to see how they studied the South African border war in, uh, with particular reference to uh, our concepts of counter -in insurgency and also with regards to uh, our concepts of uh, mobile conventional warfare. And uh, it, is, it was amazing to see how how those officers uh, respected the South African army, uh, the one that we served in. I'm glad to hear that, sir, because I know when General Petrovas, if I say his name correctly, the, the US officer, when he brought out his counterinsurgency manual, I don't think South Africa or Rhodesia was even mentioned once. Yeah, well, that's interesting to see what happened to, in Afghanistan currently. Now, it was interesting, the times that I lectured at the Defence College, um, there were four officers uh, that participated in the Art of War program of the Australians. The one was Petrias. Uh, he lectured on the counterinsurgency doctrine of the, uh, of the US, uh, US military forces, which they used in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And we know what happened in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq as well. Uh, the other one was a, 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 a brigadier general from the Israeli forces. As you well know, we always favored the Israelis. And uh, during our military careers, uh, we attended courses in, in Israel. And we also had many of their officers serving as, uh, 
as guest lecturers and as uh, as mentors for us at places like the Army College and the uh, the Army Battle School, and uh, we had great respect for them. Uh, in actual fact, one of the things that we learned from them, and I still use that with regards to community safety, is the integrated operational planning cycle, which is a which is a a planning concept which favors full participation where rank and position doesn't matter, but uh, creative thinking uh, is, 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 is optimum with regards to that. And then there was also a British general who taught the Australians on, uh, on operations such as those that, that they fared in uh, the Falklands. I think that was in 1982. So it was great, great privilege in actual fact to, uh, to have the opportunity to, to lecture at the Defence College with officers of that stature. Well, I can tell you, sir, we're proud of you. You, you are well, one of I, the famous officers. I, I don't care who says what. <laughs> People <laughs> do know about you. So even here in Switzerland, I was speaking to one of the, one of the people. And they asked me if I know the Air General the freeze. I said, well, I don't know him, but uh, I know who he is. But you people can learn from him. And so apparently they're reading your books as well, sir. They've been reading it everywhere. Um, well, that's, that's quite, that's interesting. Uh, I, I know that my first book that I wrote in, uh, in 19, when was it? In 87. 87, uh, yes. Mobile Oorlogvoering, A Perspective for Southern Africa. That, that book is used in, uh, in uh, the Dutch military schools, and then the damn CIA translated, translated that book into English, and it's available on internet without uh, getting any authorization from my side for that. But I'm quite proud of the fact that it was uh, translated into English, even if they did that with, with no authority. I have no doubt that book is also in Chinese, uh, and I'm quite sure they're not paying your royalties either. Yeah. But then bastards will get them. But perhaps I must ask you from the beginning, you were born in 1944. That was the time of uh, the Second World War. Were your parents involved in that war? Are you from a military family, sir? No, uh, not at all. My, uh, my father was, uh, was an engineer at ISCO. Uh, he later... He later on in the, in the early 50s uh, participated in the establishment of, of VICO in Van Abel Park. Uh, my mother was, Ellen was just, uh, she, she was a true mother and I had great respect for her. Um, one of uh, the treasures I value that was given to me by her and my father, uh, Herman, which uh, we called him Debbie, uh, was... Uh, the poem written by Rudyard Kipling, if which sort of became a life philosophy for me. Uh, my brother became an engineer as well. I was the eldest. Um, the, he passed away recently, and my my sister was a medical doctor. Um, she later she later on moved to uh, England, uh, and uh, she was six five years younger than me, but uh, she also passed away a few years. So I'm the only. Uh, one of, of my fam family left uh, at this stage, except for my children, of course. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your loss, sir. I wonder if we, I know about this, po this poem which you're talking about, because you sent it to me, perhaps we can put it in here somewhere. Can you tell me why that poem is so important to you? I think one thing that I learned from that, uh, from that poem is... Uh, is something that I treasured uh, with regards to my mother. Uh, I never wanted to go uh, to, to university. I wanted to join the army and become an officer and have a battalion of my own. So I did, need, did not see myself as an academic, although I wrote books and I lectured at military academies and even became the chief of, uh, of joint training with the, the various military academies under command. Uh, but I wanted to join the army. And from that poem, poem I learned something which I coined uh, at 6-1 Mechanized Battalion Group when I commanded that unit in 1981 and 1982. And uh, this came from the poem, 
which, uh, which I can quote as that every person in your organization counts. That was, uh, that was part of the concept that I learned from, from F. Rajat Kipling. And then uh, to my mind, something else that uh, I would like to share with you is the fact that, uh, that Rajat Kipling mentioned uh, the important uh, principle, the value of uh, the fact that you must be able to walk with kings, with kings but never uh, lose the common touch. And that every minute of your life matters. And that, and I saw that when I trained my my young national servicemen uh, during my my 37 years, which I spent in South South African Army. I had huge respect for our youngsters, our national servicemen, and our part-time force uh, force forces and the commanders. Um, and it was the fact that uh, people should be valued and that they should be treated with respect. And this is something which I learned from that poem. I must tell you, sir, I'm astonished. The more I'm holding these conversations, and I wish to thank everybody who, who came to us and invite everybody else. Men of men, the army did something to them, sir. They, they became... Absolutely. And you can still see it in them today. You know, what was interesting when I... When we prepared for Operation Pratia in uh, August 1981, um, I think that's something akin to 6-1 mechanized battalion and a value uh, which was inculcated into our, our mechanized forces. And this is something that, that I learned from the Germans, people like Rommel Guderian, the concept of Auftrag Statik. Uh, we used to refer to that as Bethel's initiative, command initiative. Uh, during Operation Protea, uh, we had the time available to do uh, proper deliberate planning and preparation for battle uh, and exercises. And we had umpteen war games and had the opportunity in the evenings to, to walk with my camp chair, chair uh, in, you know, in the unit lines. My troops were sleeping in tents. And uh, then play with the section commanders on, on sand models which they had prepared just outside their tents and having these wonderful discussions. And what uh, I used to do was to, uh, to let my junior officers participate in the planning with the senior staff. And uh, they were allowed to do training on their own, go into the field with live ammunition, uh, do trench clearing in the evenings at nighttime to, to practice their, uh, their navigation skills, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, our second in commands, uh, any one of my subalterns, I believed at any moment uh, during training or in battle could take over the, the combat unit and, uh, and command it uh, in, in that person's own right. And this is something which I respected from, from, from those youngsters. And uh, I can still remember well that uh, we practiced fire maneuver uh, fire movement, forward, backwards, sidewards, uh, regrouping, and uh, becoming sort of uh, experts at the whole concept of fire support coordination. And I was very proud of, uh, of this achievement by those youngsters uh, who formed units such as 6-1 Mechanized Battalion Group. And uh, to my mind, the lesson that I learned from this was sort of... Uh, uh, captured by a saying uh, by, G Major G uh, by General Guderia, who was the father of Blitzkrieg. And that was that you, you mustn't fall around, but you must establish scores. The words he used was nicht klackeren sonder klotzen. The Afrikaans for that is muni rontrap ni forum kerne. In other words, if a unit is shot to pieces, or there's a serious crisis, the, left, the next leader will take over and he will form the next uh, core of fighting soldiers and continue with the mission. Now, there were three things which, to my mind, was important, which I always inculcate, inculcated in, in my, my combat units. And uh, I would like to sort of uh, 
emphasize, emphasize these values. The first one is that the mission comes first and must always be executed in the most professional manner. Doesn't matter what happens. The mission comes first. The second one is that every leader in your organization um, is health responsible to keep his men healthy, wealthy, and wise. With other words, even if it's uncomfortable, you must wear your steel helmet. You must carry your first field dressing. You must take your tripod, tripod for your light machine gun with you, even if it's a heavy burden to carry. And the third point, and I think this is probably the most important point, is that you must allow your people to make errors, but not too many. They must be allowed to generate responsible mistakes. Otherwise, and this is especially pertinent for organizations such as mechanized units, otherwise they will never learn to take the calculated risk. I'm fascinated by this, sir, because I have to ask you, when you started in 1964, this was one year before Rhodesia became independent with the ODI. Did you know when that you're going to head to war? Were the signs there? No, you never knew. Uh, you always hoped that something would happen, that uh, you will get the chance to, to participate in a military operation. And uh, I think one of the important things, and, and this is uh, important for us today as well, when we look at the crime situation in our country, and that is that every person in our country who is threatened needs to be prepared and needs to be ready and needs to be organized into, uh, let's call it, or let's refer to it as community safety units. So this, to my mind, was extremely important, and that is to be ready, to be able to move at, at moment's notice. I can remember with Operation Macro in uh, December 1981 that 6-1 uh, MEC was able to move at the command being received from the higher headquarters to move with its complete might and strength, fully bombed up, with other words, with ammunition and all the logistic requirements you need within three hours. And this is something that I was extremely proud of, of organizations such as 6-1 MEC. So we need to be ready. We need to be prepared physically, psychologically, uh, spiritually, as, uh, as well as physically. I must ask you about that, sir, because a lot of people here listening is South Africans or former South Africans. I still have family in South Africa. We know what happened with the riots, the Zuma riots a few months ago. And I know you brought out this book, which I understand is a very good book. And we'll put the links in here as well for the people to go and get hold of that book. But besides that, sir, besides reading your book, what, what can we do? Uh... I think the answer is extremely, it's extremely simple. Um, there's a dictum, a military dictum, which I also uh, sort of stressed and discussed in my book, Mobile Warfare for, for Africa, which is CV Spark and Parabellum. Uh, if you want peace, prepare for war. To my mind, what is important is that uh, people should realize there is a threat and there's a major threat. I don't want to get go into... Uh, to, into too much uh, detail with regards to that. I describe this as a fourth generation threat, which, uh, can, which resembles the tactics being employed by organizations such as ISIS, uh, Boko Haram, uh, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. Uh, with other words, uh, even a stone in your hand is a weapon. We see what is happening in South Africa, uh, the levels of violent crime. We do not have a choice as peace-loving peace people, law-abiding citizens in our country. And I'm not talking about Afrikaners or white people alone. I'm talking about all people being threatened by crime in our country. And we know that the ANC government um, does not have the will or the means to protect, protect our, our people. We see what is happening with the municipalities in our country. And we need to get organized. And the focus must be to protect our people there where, where they are. Uh, and this is one of my main endeavors. 
and this is to establish community safety zones uh, strategically located. For example, uh, we've established 10 community safety units in the Laafeld uh, with a headquarters at, uh, at Leidenburg. And all these organizations are, are ran by community la leaders and uh, they are all volunteers and they're extremely successful and can probably uh, be compared to the commando system that we had in the past. And what I do is uh, over weekends, uh, we gather the leader groups of these respective communities who are interested into, into a planning group. We utilize the uh, integrated operational planning cycle, which I spoke about. And we start off on a Friday afternoon doing a proper terrain appreciation because that leads into the, uh, the requirements for the establishment of uh, a viable operational plan. And then the next day, we do a proper uh, re risk assessment, threat analysis, intelligence appreciation. Um, and uh, we, we assess the capabilities that we require to establish such unit. Uh, we develop the organizational structure for such a unit. Uh, we develop the operational concepts and uh, we war game those concepts. And then we write an operational order, which is handed over to the leader group of that particular uh, community safety organization so that they can start developing their capability. Uh, can you imagine that uh, if every household in our country could be involved in, in such a process where every family and groups of family take responsibility for their own safety and they work together and we establish them into viable uh, community safety organizations, working with the South African Police Service, working with the relevant interest groups, such as uh, neighborhood watches, other forms of neighborhood watches, uh, such as uh, community uh, policing forums, and of course, uh, agricultural organizations and civic rights organizations, such as Opry Forum. What a powerful, um, capability we could establish uh, over our country um, as volunteers working uh, ardently to safeguard our people. I always compare it to a spider web, uh, which you can draw across your country. If you touch it anywhere on that, on one of those, those uh, tentacles, it, uh, it vibrates right through the organization. So with regards to these concepts, uh, command and control is emphasized. We established uh, uh, volunteer-based command and control systems. Many of the organizations established the, their own operation centers, such as the Farlots Community Safety Unit has done on, on one of the farms uh, in Mahahong. Of course, intelligence is extremely important. I view that as the main, main driver. The, the, the South African Police Service, and, and they acknowledge it, they don't have crime intelligence. So it's important that we establish community uh, intelligence systems uh, so that we can have prior knowledge of anything happening. I refer to this as a system of seeing, uh, deciding, and then, then acting. And then also making provision for operational uh, planning systems. And of course, we need rapid deployment teams. We need intelligence teams. Uh, we, need, we need home and health protection elements and then we need to support these organizations by means of uh, uh, technology and, uh, and also uh, utilizing support systems such as legal, legal support, uh, neighborhood support uh, for, for, for tra trauma uh, support, etc., uh, media liaison and communication, and of course, medical support. We need to get organized and to protect our people because the South African police services, in actual fact, the security apparatus of our country, we saw that happening in KZN, does not have the ability to protect our people. What you're saying here, sir, can we summarize this common sense? You've been pre-warned. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is a Latin thing like that, also pre-warned, pre-armed or something, for armed. But it takes... It takes the will to do so. 
and uh, we need to wake up. You're right, and sir. Just do it. Yeah. So now I must ask you directly: Do you need funding to do this? Well, yes, one needs funding at this stage. Um, I'm doing it out of my own pocket. Uh, this is not a business for me. And in many cases, uh, when, for example, I'm, I'm busy with an exercise now supporting uh, the Southeast Free State. We're preparing for exercise early in, in February. Uh, they prepared to help me with my, uh, my, my travel uh, uh, to get from point A to point B. And normally they provide my accommodation for me, uh, but I don't. I don't ask anything for, for for these uh, these work sessions. And of course, all the intellectual cap ca uh, capacity, uh, all the intellectual capital that I have available, I provide that to them free of charge. The book Veiligheid van Gemeenschappen is provided by Naledi at a reasonable uh, price. I think the price of the book is. Uh, 295 rands. Uh, Johan could see of Naledi said to me, Roland, I will publish this, this book uh, at, 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 at a low cost so that we can make it available for our people. We've also developed a, a aid memoir, a sock book, a pocket book, which is sort of a summary of the book, which I provide free of charge to communities who are, pre who are prepared to, to support their people uh, to, to help them with, uh, with, with uh, the empowerment for self-protection. May I say the following, sir? The fact that we served 30 years ago, 30, my wife always tells me that. Amazing to think about that. 30 probably. Yeah. Uh, we're not really prepared right now just because we are in the army or police 30 years ago. We really yeah. need to, to get a wake up. Am, am I correct? Absolutely. I think awareness with regards to the situation in our country is extremely important. I'm extremely positive with regards to what's happening here. I, I believe that uh, political changes will come. Uh, to my mind, uh, an extremely important strategic facet now is to keep our people safe there where they are, whilst we are waiting for uh, sensible political uh, changes to happen. And we don't have a choice with regards to that. So if somebody wants to join up, so if he's listening here and he's on fire, what do I, what does he do? They must just contact me. Okay, can yeah. I leave your and, uh, address? By the way, you? I work over weekends, so I only have 52 weekends uh, available in, uh, in uh, you know, in, in the sort of annuals uh, uh, in a year available to, to uh, do my work. Uh, but I will talk, talk to them and see what, what we can do. Uh, for the last uh, five years, I have uh, already been involved uh, in more than 51 places where, where I've done this work. Uh, my, my worst two weeks uh, was last year. Um, I can't exactly remember the month, but uh, I spent a weekend with... Uh, the community at uh, Port Alfred, the Sunshine Coast, left there for Aberdeen. The next weekend it was Far Lots, and then it was off to Kuruman. And from Kuruman it was uh, uh, down to our area from the Bellpark for Eniging Linnequist Drift, then, then Heidelberg. And from there it was uh, off to Rutan, after that Tolwe and then Northern, and then back to Janssenville. And when I arrived at home, uh, it was still, I can remember it was already dark and it was raining. When, uh, when I sort of debussed, I was, I was staggering, so tired. You know, it was, it was a tiring exercise. But uh, it, uh, there's great satisfaction, uh, which I derived from these exercises working with people uh, I refer to them as, as Gideon's Benders, uh, Gideon Bands of dedicated, dedicated community leaders who are working ardently uh, 
with regards to the protection of their of their people, their communities. Can I say you're an expert at counterterrorism? And a while ago on this very show, we had Dr. Willem Piestien come here. He's the nephew of Major Willem, the historian. And he's an ambassador, attorney, PhD, and also a former national intelligence member, a senior one. And he gave us a, a briefing, and we're very grateful for it on the Zuma riots. And he said, without any doubt, he said it straight, that was an insurrection. That no, was there's no question about that. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I work extensively in the Moerava area, uh, as well as now recently in the uh, northern Natal area, Lowsburg, places like that, uh, um, Petrativ, uh, Paul Petersburg, uh, Pongola, and, 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 and those areas. I traveled the N17, N2, and N3. I know exactly where all the burn marks are on Tom McAdam. I traveled, this was in July and August, just after the routes opened. I traveled uh, through Durban, uh, through Moerava, uh, through Bulwa, uh, and then to Annaberg. It was, it was terrible to see what happened in Bulwa. But was, what was exciting was when I... Uh, returned to Bulwa about approximately two weeks later, it was in August, and I traveled uh, from Annaberg back through Bulwa to uh, Moerava. There were people repairing their shops. I saw Indians, Pakistanis. I saw a Ch Chinese gentleman. I saw white guys with front-end loaders, the people working together to repair their shops. I visited a farmer uh, Gerard de Ploy. He lives uh, just outside Bulwa uh, uh, in a homestead uh, which was built in 1885. I, I believe it was a border post uh, from, from that pioneering era. And uh, I had breakfast with Gerard de Ploy and his family and I asked him, why, why was your, your home saved? And he said, when the trouble started, he's got, got such a good relationship with the uh, black people in his, uh, in his environment, that they came out to protect his home. And to me, it was, excuse me, it was heartening to see what all many people were, do, were doing to protect, protect their livelihoods. And uh, I, I, I drove through roadblocks where white and black people and taxis was, were manning these roadblocks together through the night. And uh, to my mind, this is the South Africa which I would like to see. Uh, we're notwithstanding uh, the, the, the extremely negative effects of current politics, especially by the ANC government, where people, uh, ordinary people, can, can start standing up and working together to uh, establish viable communities all over South Africa. And I see that happening all over where I, where I visit communities and work with them. Now, just with regards to the threat, um, this is something that I normally uh, do when I have my, my uh, planning sessions, is to ask the people to uh, do an assessment with regards to the stages of revolutionary warfare, uh, which we find ourselves in. Now, this comes from a book that, which was written by John J. McEwen, The Art of Counter-Revolutionary Warfare. And as you, as you all know, those members who served in South African army. Uh, we spoke about the phases of counter-revolutionary warfare, starting off with phase one, uh, which is the uh, mobilization and organization phase. Uh, we saw that happening with organizations such as the EFF, where they started with their student movements, their farmer movements, and, and training their, their cadres, which caused uh, many insurrections in places, places like all over our country, uh, but especially in places like Armanus. It was a crying shame to see this. The next phase, of course, is the terrorism phase. Uh, we see that happening in our country when we look at the uh, levels of, uh, of uh, trouble uh, ensuing in towns, the illegal uh, closing down of roads, uh, illegal uh, home invasions, and, and, uh, and, and 
grabbing of land, etc. And of course, the next phase, which then develops into the guerrilla phase. And this is typically your, your farm attacks where we find five, 15 well-trained uh, gang members from the organized crime environment ex executing a precision attack, uh, finely timed, uh, well-rehearsed, uh, armed with AK-47s and cell blocking uh, telephone devices on their backs and then executing that mission and then disappearing, disappearing into the underworld. And then, of course, the final phase is uh, the escalation of conflict, such as we had in, in KZN in July and August, uh, which could develop into civil war. And uh, normally, and I find this everywhere, when I, when I ask the communities uh, whom I work with, uh, how do they assess our situation? Then it is clear to me that they see us already in phase three and, and moving into, touching into the realm of, of phase four, which is higher levels of insurrection and uh, high levels of civil disobedience. We saw that way in Clarstorp today and yesterday. So yes, we are in trouble and it's necessary for us first to wake up. You're quite right, sir. And of course, it's when you say wake up, wake up within the scope of the law. But if I might ask you, should you put your general hat on and you are somehow enabled to give orders, what orders will you start issuing here to, the, <coughs> sorry, to the men and women listening to you right now? Well, you know, uh, what is important to me and... Uh, for all, for all of us who have, uh, uh, have tasted war, and that is that uh, the purpose of any military operation or war as such is to create a better form of peace. Um, I, would like, I would not like to see war, war uh, developing in our country or, or us even moving to a situation where we become involved in a, in a civil war but I'm extremely perturbed about uh, the situation in our country and what is happening. Um, I do not believe that the ANC government has the uh, best interest of all the communities in our country at heart. And we need to, to find a political situ situation. I know that we are not happy with the situation uh, that the South African Police Service and even the South African National Defense Force finds itself in. We saw that in KZN. Uh, also the neglect of our uh, security apparatus, specifically, specifically with regards to our intelligence services. You know, simple, if I put my army general hat on, uh, if we take the situation with the incarceration of Zuma, uh, if I was uh, in the Defense Staff Council or the Command Council of the military, uh, we would have done a proper risk assessment and would have deployed forces uh, in time so that we could prevent the, uh, the, uh, the tragic situation uh, which, which occurred. Uh, to my mind, and uh, I believe that we, this is not a military solution, and this is not a solution where we are going to flee to, uh, to vast areas along the Orange River in the Northern Cape. Uh, I think we have the right in terms of our constitution to protect ourselves, to live. And I think it's time that communities take responsibility for their own protection and also for self-reliance, more self-reliance and start taking over control over the bad situations we have in most of our, our, of our municipalities. I believe that we have good people in our country, black and white, Indian colored, doesn't matter. And that it is time to stand together, to stand up and to start taking action. In other words, we must take control over our safety situations and we must uh, take control over our, uh, our service delivery situations that we have in our various areas. I see this happening in places like Koster. Uh, I've, got a, I, I've got a good friend, Martins van der Merwe, who's an engineer. He lives in Leidenburg. 
I see how they are taking ownership of service delivery in that their various areas. I see this happening in Graaf uh, It It is time that we take control over our in, own destiny because the NC government does not have the capability or the means to, to do this. Uh, it is time for communities to stand up. If I might approach it from the other way around, sir, should there be people here who is ignoring you now, what will be the consequences? People always find a way through. Uh, I don't believe that I'm the only answer. Uh, I try to help at my age. Uh, I'm here to support my people. Uh, to my mind, the lesson that I learned from Northern Natal is something which is heartening. And that is when the trouble started overnight, community leaders came to the fore, they took control, they took control of Pongola, they safeguarded Pongola, they ma made their plans and they safeguarded the, the, the areas. And uh, I learned a lot from those people when, uh, when we had workshops uh, the last few months in those areas, a number of workshops, where we listened to the respective people sharing their lessons learned and how those people took control. I believe that we have the leadership uh, which is embedded in our communities and that the time will come, and I think the time is now, where the leaders of our respective communities uh, must stand up and take control. We've got good people there all over our country uh, with uh, the necessary knowledge. It, um, it just needs to, to be uh, uh, infused into sort of uh, community safety uh, strategies and also uh, strategies to become more self-reliant. Generally, you know, South Africa is a political society. There might be people here with a wrong idea, but what you're talking about is a far right wing type of thing, which is like uh, going back to the old days. Can you tell me, should such, such ideas, would that be true or false? Most definitely not, because uh, I can assure you that I was never involved in politics. In actual fact, I sort of abhor it. And to my mind, this is a, this is a, a thing about people and uh, this concerns the good people of South Africa and I'm talking about all peace loving uh, law abiding citizens so what I'm doing sort of in uh, at, at the end of my life uh, ending my career it's a great privilege to still be of service to my people and to help with the, to help them uh, with uh, their empowerment for for self protection and uh, to my mind, this is a thing. I always say there are enough people causing panic in our country. Uh, we need to create hope and uh, raise their confidence uh, in faith. Uh, to my mind, this whole exercise is a faith-based exercise. And uh, I always say that this battle that we are in now in, in South Africa is a battle that belongs to the Lord. And uh, this is... Uh, what we need to do. Uh, we need to, to work uh, for the betterment of our people and secure our livelihood because we are living in one of the best countries in, in the world. So thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in, in this dialogue. Thank you for what you are doing. I thank you, sir. And I would like to urge everybody who has been listening here, go and support the general. See how you can get involved. It's too late. If you don't do it, you have to get involved right now. And I also, as I always say to people, no one who served ever was unimportant. I'm sure the general will agree. Every one of you who served, you're welcome here. Come and tell us your story. We would gladly uh, edit it, put it out there for everybody to enjoy. Until we meet again, God bless. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, the old dictum of 6-1, make every person counts. Thank you so much.